All right, before we get into our study for the day, are there any questions to start us out? How old are you? How old am I? I, I am, uh, you know, how uh, St. Paul says, you know, I received 40 lashes minus one. I'm, I'm now 40 plus one. So, <laughs> so my, my, my 40th was happy ruined birthday. by COVID. <laughs> I can believe it, right? Well, happy birthday. Thank you. That's all right, I never turned 40. You never turned 40? No, because I crossed the international date line. <laughs> Don missed a, missed a birthday because of his service in the Navy and he lost the international day lines and so forth. So, that's a need. I am not even turning this on today, so I'm making rid of this. temporal 
matters. Okay, this comes up uh, when you interact with coworkers, comes up when you interact with your kids, uh, all the different stuff going on. If you know the commandments, you've got a good grasp of them, your advice, your counsel to them will be that much better. Okay? And then you are qualified to, to sit in judgment over all doctrines, estates, we'll talk about that word in a little bit, <clears throat> spirits, laws, and whatever else is in the world. That if you know the commandments well, you can, you can look at a news story and you can judge it based upon the commandments. And you can understand what's going on in this news story. And how does this relate to God's Word, the way God has organized and ordered the world around us? Uh, and it can be very helpful in that way. Okay? Where do we find the commandments? Yeah, Bill. We got this situation where Nicodemus came to Jesus, and there is a discussion, and then uh, Jesus says, the man has to be born again. And Nicodemus is thinking of temple. spiritual side of the commandments, this is what happens when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, is he shows them the Pharisees think that because they haven't murdered anyone, they've kept the fifth commandment. Jesus shows them that no, if you have been, uh, if you have hated your brother, you've murdered him already. He, he shows them the spirit of the commandments. This is the, the depth of them. Now in earthly matters, you're going to be dealing with a lot of just the outward, okay? Uh, but there's the spiritual side of it too. So where do we find the commandments? They are written down in two places in Scripture. Exodus 20, uh, where the Lord speaks to all the people. And I, and I say here, note how unique this is. Um, it is not often in Holy Scripture, in fact, I think this is the, the only time in the Old Testament, where God speaks to all the people. Uh, not just through Moses, not just to Aaron, um, and then on to the people, not through one of the prophets and onto the people, but where he speaks to all the people. What, what's the result? They're terrified. They're terrified, right? Um, the, the people are terrified. Exodus chapter 19, all of this is going on on the mountaintop. There's the fire and the thunder and the lightnings and so forth. The people are absolutely terrified. And, and they say to Moses, you know, please... Tell God this is too much. And, and God says something to the effect of, the people are right in what they say. Therefore I will mediate to them through Moses, Aaron, and so forth, and, and company following through. Okay. Um, and so here you have the, the commandments, Exodus 20. Deuteronomy is just a fancy word for second law, which is just a, a second account of it. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 5 then retells uh, what Exodus 20 said. Okay? So, so we have here in, in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, the commandments are the first word of God that is written down. Okay? But this, you know, we, we are used to having a written Bible in front of us. But, but really when you go back in history and you figure out the chronology of it, the first written word of God is the commandments. And it's written on the tablets of stone, and it's written by God Himself. Right? The finger of God. Right? Is, is the way that Exodus 20 tells us. And in Deuteronomy 5. And so this is the significance of the commandments. That the first written word of God, written by specifically God Himself. Now that doesn't mean the rest of Scripture is any less than it. We all know that all Scripture is God-inspired or God-breathed. Right? 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, but, but here we have the significance that when it comes to the commandments, God writes them by his own fingers on the tablets of stone. Right? We also find the commandments largely um, across cultures, across peoples. The scriptures talk about this, how God has written his law on man's heart. That there is a kind of natural knowledge of, of this kind of law. But it's, 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 it's skewed. It's, it's been kind of erased. It's, it's kind of like if you had a chalkboard and you wrote something up on it and you just took your hand and you 
wiped across it. You know, you, you might be able to read it, but you might have to guess on a few letters. Right? And so that's the way it is on man's heart. Because sinful nature being what it is, original sin being what it is, uh, and then man's hardness to the things of God causes this kind of ignorance of the law, uh, willful ignorance even, um, this kind of forgetfulness of the law, um, and, and so forth. And this is the kind of thing that you saw with the Pharisees. Uh, they knew it, they studied it, but yet they figured out ways around it. I mean, this is, uh, they, they thought they had figured out ways around it. Okay? Alright, so let's go to Exodus 20 quick. I want to see this from God's Word. Okay. <coughs> Alright, so again, on, in Exodus 19, this is the setup. It's, you know, the mountain scene and the fires and the thunder and the lightning and so forth. And then finally you get to the commandments themselves. Uh, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Okay. I want you to note the uniqueness, or, or this is often forgotten when we think about the commandments. God introduces the commandments after he first tells us about who he is and what he does. Okay? Um, that, that first God leads before into the commandments of, you shall know their gods before me. He, he starts out with this statement of who he is. I am the Lord, your God. Okay? Um, I, I teach the catechumens this all the time, that when you run across these per possessive uh, pronouns, like your, mine, um, ours, uh, these are words which call forth faith, to trust this. That as he's getting ready to introduce the commandments to his people, he's first reminding them of their faith, their belief in him, and how he is their God. Okay? And then he, he speaks of what he has done for them, right? That, that who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And this is going to bring to mind all kinds of stuff, right? What have they just experienced coming out of Egypt? Ten plagues, yeah, crossing ten of the plagues, Red Sea. Yeah, ten plagues, crossing of the Red Sea. All these, these wonderful things that happen that testify to this Lord, their God. And his might <clears throat> and his power but also his care and his protection. And, and so, so this is you know, one of the questions we ask our confirmation kids. Uh, what has Jesus done for you that you would trust in him? Uh, well, this is kind of set up by this kind of understanding that God himself starts out, even before he lays down these rules, he tells them about himself and what he does and what he has done for them. And he's brought them out of the house of slavery. Literally, but also spiritually as well. Okay? And then he goes into the commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay? Literally before my face. Okay? Nothing shall be allowed before God's face. It's not, it's not um, we'll cover more of this next week, but it's not like God says, you can't have any other gods as number one. The other gods have to be number two or three or four. No, no. He's saying no other gods. Okay. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything that is heaven above or earth beneath, water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord God, am a jealous God. Okay, here's the close of the commandments we take, we call it that, and we'll cover it at the end here. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers, the children of the third and fourth generation, those who hate me, showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, so this is all first commandment. Some traditions break that one into the second commandment. And then they bump the other commandments and they don't have two coveting commandments. Okay? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. There's a part of that that we don't often hear. Right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, female servant, livestock, sojourner within your gates. Okay, so there's Sabbath rest. It's supposed to be to the Lord your God. Not to your bodies and rest and so forth in that respect, 
but to the Lord. That it's a day dedicated to hearing God's word. And then he reconfesses exactly what we believe from Genesis chapter 1 and 2. <coughs> For in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay. Uh, for those that think that Genesis 1 and 2 can mean anything other than actually six days where God creates everything, um, they have to argue with the commandments at that point. Okay. Um, because he confirms it right here. And then he moves away from man's relationship with him and goes into the areas of man's relationship with other men. Honor your father and your mother. That your days may be long in the land that the Lord has given you. St. Paul says this is the first commandment with a promise. Right? Your days will be long in the land. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. There is the commandments. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. Okay. The commandments can create great fear, which is a good fear. Remember, we, we, in that catechism explanation of the commandments, we should fear and love God. Okay. It has to do with that close of the commandments. It threatens to punish all those. He also promises grace and every blessing to those who keep his commandments. Okay, so fear and love, right there. Right? Um, and, they, and they stood far off and they said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen. Do not let God speak to us lest we die. Right? This, is, this is throughout the scriptures. When sinners get in the presence of God, what happens? Uh, they get very fearful and, and, and very afraid they're going to be dead. Okay? This is sin in face of holiness. Moses said to the people, do not fear. Often related to when people are afraid of God, the preachers of God say, do not fear. For God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. This is the same mountain, of course, uh, Mount Sinai, is where uh, the burning bush happened as well, way before it. So that's how Moses... Moses is familiar with this place. Right? So, Alright, so that's where we find them in Scripture. Um, you find them kind of expounded upon in the preaching of the prophets. You find them expounded upon greatly in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, when Jesus is teaching, and he specifically is using... The law to rebuke the fake righteousness of the Pharisees, who thought they had kept God's law. And they thought by keeping God's law, they themselves were gaining heaven. Okay? And to that, of course, Jesus brings out the law in its full force, shows them that, no, you're not keeping the law. Um, but, but we're supposed to look to Christ for our salvation, not to our keeping of the law. Okay? So what does the law do? One of the concepts we're going to go through in this is, this is often not understood well, um, the law helps institute and protect gifts of God. That if God makes a commandment about something, it means that that something <clears throat> is important. Right? You don't put a fence around something that's worthless. Right? You put a fence up to keep something in or to protect something from outside, from getting in. So what's inside the fence is important. And so if you think of the commandments like a fence, they're God's way of saying what this is set up to protect is important. And so you can go through all the commandments, <clears throat> and you can find out what, what that means. Uh, first commandment, God institutes himself. Second commandment, his name. That is... Prayer and these kind of things. Third commandment is worship and his word. You know, this is why the, the definitions, the explanations of the commandments do what they do. Fourth commandment, families, parents and children. 
Fifth commandment, human life itself. Sixth commandment, marriage. Seventh commandment, private property. Eighth commandment, your reputation. Your name. Ninth and tenth commandments, God institutes contentment, which is, of course, lacking. And that's why we're covetous. Because if you're content, you're not coveting what isn't yours. If you're content, you're fine. That's why the ninth and tenth commandments are there. Okay, so this is just kind of what God is doing by these commandments. He's setting up these fences, these hedges around these special and important things. Okay, so this already begins to start informing how we look at the different assaults upon these commandments we see around us. And then, of course, bringing it to a much more personal level, we can see then the damage we do by our sins to these institutions, these things of God, that he would have protected. Okay? What does the law do? It defines sin. Okay? If you're going to go up to somebody and say, you have sinned, you better have a commandment in mind. That this is, this is, the commandments define what is sin. And if there's a sin going on, you better be able to tack it to at least one commandment. And usually you can attack it to more than just one. Okay? Yeah. Um, the commandments or the law establishes true morality. Okay? Sometimes people get mistaken and think morality is something that's culturally defined. No. God's word defines morality, and specifically the commandments define what is moral, what is good. Same thing with the next one. The commandments teach us true love. Okay, this word gets bantered around all the time, um, love. But unless that definition of love has its root in what the commandments say, that's not love. Um, that, that the commandments define what is love. That is, how do you love God? You take the first three commandments. That's how you love God. How do you love other people? You look at commandments 4 through 10. That's how you love other people. Okay? Um, teaches us God's will. What does God want me to do with my life? Well, what's his will? The commandments tell us his will. Commandments, like I said, help us make confession of our sins or prepare for the Lord's Supper. Okay, that when we prepare for these things, uh, I'll be teaching the confirmands this, this week, hopefully. Um, as we, as we can prepare for these great gifts of God to hear absolution or receive Jesus' body and blood, um, part of that is acknowledging you're a sinner. And how do you find out you have sins? You examine your life according to the Ten Commandments. So they help us make confession, or they help us prepare for receiving the supper. Okay? They help us to see the world rightly as Christians. Okay? That these commandments are going to help us see the issues in a way that, that is defined by God's word, rather than defined by um, political narratives, or personal feelings, or things like that. We want to be people of the word of God, and these commandments are part of the word of God, and they help define the issues. It's really helpful. They help us to stay anchored to God's word of truth in this earthly life. Okay? And lastly, on the other end of things, they help us to understand what the devil, the world, and the sinful flesh are doing. Okay? If these commandments are set up to protect certain gifts or institutions of God, you can be assured that the devil, the world, and the sinful flesh hate these things of God. And so they are going to try to transgress these boundaries that God has put around them. And so they'll try to redefine the fences, they'll try to take the fences away, they'll try to jump over the fence. Any way of explaining it possible, the devil, the world, and the flesh hate the things of God, and so they will try to get around these commandments. Okay? Yeah? Sure. How do, they, how do you even break through that barrier? Well, I mean, you can go the route of logic, which will help some. Yeah. But in the end, you can't expect a pagan 
to believe in an absolute truth. Because a pagan doesn't believe in God. Um, and, and, and since we believe in God, we have absolute truth. Because we have God's word. So, so logically, you can, you can attack it by saying some things like, you know, are you, is, is, isn't that an absolute truth, that there is no absolute truth? You know, you can show the, the irrationality of what they're claiming, um, which works with those who are rational. Uh, but in, in the world today, the, the worst damage is done in that we've gone away from even rational. Um, it, it's not a matter of thinking anymore, it's a matter of feeling. And, and it, it's, it's even worse than that. Um, I was reading in, in 2 Corinthians, um, where, where God talks about, or where St. Paul's talking about um, how after, after thinking comes feeling, but there's one level of degradation lower than feeling yet, and that is just like living like crass animals in, in like the lewdness of conduct. And, and so, so we're, if, if someone's at a feeling state, they're not, they're, it could be worse. <laughs> Uh, they could just fall into that kind of just animal-like, um, which, you know, we see that kind of, we see that paved way towards that thinking with the whole evolutionary theory, that you are just an animal like the rest, and so you have these animal instincts, and how dare anyone tell you you can't follow through on these animalistic instincts. That's that lewdness. It's not even feeling anymore. It's just cracks. Right? The way that you get through to someone is you can try logic, sure, but you, but you also just, you have God's word. And, and how did any of you become a Christian? God had to make you a Christian. And he used God's word, his own word, to do that. Whether it was the words of, of the institution for holy baptism, or whether it was the words of some preacher, some family member, um, some parent, uh, who just taught God's word to you. That God has power, and God uses that word, he uses his power through that word, uh, to make Christians. Now, specifically, the one to make Christians is the word of the gospel. That's the word of what God has done. What he has done for the forgiveness of sins. But presumpt presumptive of that is a knowledge of sin. Which comes from the commandments. And so it's law and gospel. And, and so, you know, as you interact with people... We're, this is what some of the, one of the books I'm reading for the summer... Um, hopefully to use. It, it goes into this. Uh, that You have to kind of ha have knowledge of the person and, and it's gotten to the point where you kind of have to have a, a level of respect for each other. That this isn't talking about street preaching you know, on a corner. That, that we're talking more about actually knowing and, and caring about people. Some of it is because you know, different movements have just ruined the idea of like open preaching or telling a stranger or something. So, well, we'll hopefully cover that this summer. Yeah. I think one thing, too, you really have to watch your government institutions, not just your school, well, school certainly, but yeah. everything, because uh, in working for different government institutions, I know one time they came in and said, well, you had to take all visions of Christianity off your walls, and that the crosses had to come down, isn't that? Sure. But then you go to a, a different job I had, and so we would come out with a 4-H program that we have two daddies and we're supposed to teach this stuff. And, uh, you know, and I realize there's people that have those issues, but I don't know that I wanted to teach it. Correct. I certainly got in a lot of trouble with the dating because I didn't. Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, I think you have to watch what they're imposing on even your teachers to teach. Well, so, so what commandment establishes government? Fourth. 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 Right? Honor your father and mother. That the authority of government derives from parents. The authority of father and mother. And so, if God, or if, if Satan and the world hate the things of God, and mothers and fathers are of God, and thus government is of God, that the devil, the world, and the sinful nature will seek out ways to undermine even the government. Corrupt it. God, I'm sorry. It says in Scripture that government is created of God. So we, we affirm what Scripture says, even if we see sinful men abusing it and, and misusing it. But, they but it still take, is of God. They will so. take your job, and they will do sure. anything to make you conform to whatever that irrationality is. Sure. But here's, here's the thing, is Christians, should we expect any less? 
Jesus says this. He says, if this is what they do to me, what are they going to do to you? Okay? So, so we should not, it, it is a delusion that we think that we're going to make it through unscathed in this life. It, it's a delusion to think that we're not going to have crosses and burdens to bear. That in fact, as Christians, we are going to have crosses and burdens to bear. That's just what scripture says. If this is what they did to Jesus, so, so think of even today's gospel lesson. What do they do to Jesus? They accuse him of being a half-breed Samaritan idolater, and even worse, they say he has a demon. So in a way, they attack his person with a Samaritan charge, and then they attack his teaching with the demon charge. Okay? That his teaching is demonic, therefore. Right? And what does Jesus respond with? He defends his teaching. The Samaritan charge, he never even addresses it. This is just the way, the way the world is going to be to Christians. And so there's certain aspects where we just have to learn to push it aside. But when they attack the doctrine of Christ and what God's word says, then we should have a good defense of that word. Not a mean defense. Again, the scriptures say that we're to be kind in all these situations. That kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And if we're going to be God's witnesses in the world around us, and bring glory to His name, we're going to exhibit, we're wanting to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, the, the virtues that God gives us. And that's going to be really hard work, because we have sinful flesh. And that sinful flesh, when we all of a sudden feel the burden of a cross including the burden of somebody who's starting to hate our guts because we're Christians, or making our job difficult because we're Christians, um, our flesh is going to want to retaliate. But that's not what God's Word says we should do. Our flesh wants to do that. We're to curb our flesh. And we're to look to what God's Word is telling us to do. That is to show kindness. Right? Turn the other cheek, as Jesus says. So, so this is, yeah, that you know, government is of God. Sinners are in government, and you bet they are going to mess things up. Um, but how as Christians do we do this? And there we have the finest example in Jesus. Did the government do right by Jesus? No. They put him to death. Um, they mistreated him even before that. So, um, yeah. Alright, the law that interacts with us, okay, these are the, the, the uses of the law, sometimes you see the word function used here, uh, there's three ways that God's law is used by the Holy Spirit upon us, and that is, the first one is a curb, and this is for all people, right, that this kind of hems in the public, that, it, that society, this is how you have laws against murder, and you have people who generally don't commit murder. Right? Uh, that you usually have in society is something about marriage. Now, it gets all twisted and mon monkeyed up, certainly. But you, you see this, the curb. The most important use of the law is the next one, the mirror. This is when we take the law of God and we examine ourselves by it. That it shows us every single wrinkle, every single you know black mark, every single whatever. Right? That when we reflect upon the law, it will show us our sin. It always accuses sinners. And so long as we are sinners, the law will accuse us of sin. Not only accusing us, but it does always accuse us. Okay? It does other things for us too. So that gets us to the third use, or the third function of the law, uh, as God uses it upon us, is the guide. This is unique to Christians. Pagans will have no understanding of this. Okay? And this is unique to Christians. The law aids in the mortification of the flesh by reminding it what God's will is. Sit down, flesh. God wants this. Okay? That's a sure rule and norm. Showing which works God has prepared. That's Ephesians 2, right? Uh, the works which God prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. Okay? In which he wants the reborn to walk and to serve him. 
This is where we get into, you know, what, what's God's will for my life? What does God want me to do? Okay. So this is what we learn in the Catechism. Consider your station in life according to the commandments. We just talk about which sins should we confess, right? So this station in life, the, help, the, the commandments help us to shape this. That we have in this life three areas, three estates that used to be called. Um, a few years ago we taught on this and we used the phrase outpost because uh, it's kind of a, a, a better phrase. I like outpost because it puts us as kind of strangers in a foreign land. You know, an outpost is, is out there. And it's not necessarily surrounded by friendlies. Okay? But if you're an outpost, right? And, and you have these three different outposts that, that are the home, the church, and the state or the society. And, and by organizing our, our thoughts uh, this way, by using these three theological categories, we can make better sense. And then we use the commandments in relation to these three to make really good sense about our role in, in our homes, our role in our church, our role in the state or society, um, our sins in those things. Okay. And you have colleagues in each of these outposts, sometimes multiple, right? In a home, if, if you are, um, I'll, just, I'll just use myself as an example, I'm a husband and a father in my home. I'm also a son, a brother, an uncle. You know, these are all those familiar relationships. And so God's Word has so organized my life, uh, as anyone's life, into this category of my home, the, the outpost or the estate of home. These are the vocations and callings I have. So now as a husband, I can now apply the commandments to what I do as a husband. As a father, these commandments speak to how I should be a father. As a son, as an uncle, so forth, okay? Now I go to the church. There are really two vocations in the church. There's preachers and there's hearers. God has given me the vocation of preacher. And so then I can look at the commandments and how I've done the commandments in my vocation as a preacher. This will lead to confession of sin, but it also leads to me understanding my job, my duties that I have to do. Yes, Tim. Correct. Well, that's that's the uh, that's a very beautiful, practical aspect of having multiple pastors, is that I do actually get to be a hearer. But yeah, preachers are always first are hearers, um, because that's that's the two vocations: the preacher and hearer. And if you're not up there, the preacher, then, then you're a hearer. Um, this is the this is the great confusion with the last 50 years of trying to get everyone involved up front, rather than just letting the preachers take care of it, right? Because if you want to get everyone involved up front, now you've turned a whole lot of people out of their spot, out of their God-given vocation of hearer. And now you're trying to make them in preachers, which they don't have that calling. The best place for you to be in church is the place where God has put you. Preachers, hearers. Okay? Um, and then you go to the state. Well, God has, has made me a citizen of the United States a resident of the state of Wyoming, and so uh, a, a resident of, of the community of Cheyenne, the city of Cheyenne. Now I can look at the commandments and I can see, okay, as a, as a uh, citizen of the city of Cheyenne, what would God have me do? You know, when I run across uh, a store, or I run across my neighbor two doors down, or, you know, saw plenty, of, plenty of examples of this of the snowstorm. And neighbors trying to help one another. Right? right? Well, that is a great rule. Be kind. Jesus would just sum it up and say, love one another as yourselves. Right? Um, love your neighbor as yourself. So you take this outpost and the commandment, tells you what you should do, how or what you should pray. Okay? So we talked about doing. That's usually the most common one. But it also helps us inform how or what we should pray for. And how or what we pray for others. When I pray for you as your pastor, and I'm praying for you as the hearers in this church, I pray for certain things. When I pray for you as your pastor about relationship you have in your home estate, I pray for different things. <coughs> you know, 
As I pray for you as a hearer, I'm praying for you coming to church and being open to hearing God's word, that the Spirit would use that word to strengthen your faith in Jesus and so forth. But when I'm praying for you as a husband, I'm praying that you would be, remain faithful to your wife and that you would uh, sacrificially love and serve her. You know, all these, those, so the commandments help shape our, our prayers as well. Uh, and then, of course, we talked about this, what you need to repent of, that the commandments show us our sins. And you look at the outposts in which we live, the vocations we have in those outposts, and it will very quickly tell us that what we need to confess and, and what we need to repent of. Okay? Um, I'm not sure I'll get into this one. Um, maybe next week I'll cover it. This idea, we, we pray and we, we ask for piety, a pious life. Okay? When we think of piety... Uh, when you think of piety, most people think of, you know, what's your prayer life like? You know, what's your Bible reading like? That's your piety. But the term piety, um, it, it is so much more broad than that. Piety has to do with how you conduct every aspect of your life in relation to God. So when, when St. Paul says, do your work as unto the Lord, even if your, your master or your boss stinks, uh, he, he's, he's saying a very pious thing. That your day-to-day -day work, your job, um, has, has significance before God in heaven. And that's piety. That's, that's being pious. Is, is realizing the tasks you're given have, have God-given value. And as you do them, you're doing them not just amongst the people, but before God himself. And it has weight there. Okay? So here's what the, the, the real comes down to this is, is. What can we expect when we study the commandments? Okay? As we go through these next ten weeks, as we go through the commandments, we're going to end up running into things uh, that are going to mm, affect us. Okay? That's because God's, work, God's word is given us for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, as we told in 2 Timothy. So it's going to teach us God's will, which is to train us in righteousness. It's going to probably remind us of our catechesis, okay? however long ago that was. Uh, some of you who've had kids through confirmation, some of it will sound very familiar. It's going to reveal our sin. This is a big one. But as we go through the commandments, if we're going to do a commandment a week, we're going to get pretty in-depth. And that means that it's going to un unravel some things in you. And it's going to shine light on things in you if you're listening and you're paying attention and you're being reflective of what we're learning and what we're being taught. Um, it's going to reveal sins. Now, the question is, is what do you do with that? Right? So there's, there's a couple ways you can react. Your sinful nature will want to react to the revealing of your sin in defensiveness and self-justification. That's what the sinful nature will want to do with its knowledge of sin. The new nature created in Christ Jesus will want to use it as an occasion to confess sin. Okay? That, that this is the opportunity, and that if you've had sin revealed, that you've committed, this is the opportunity to confess sin and hear God's word of forgiveness for that sin. Now that certainly happens in divine service with the general confession, but I also would encourage you to think about private confession and absolution in that regard. It's going to rebuke our errors. And it's going to correct it with truth. And so maybe we've taken up some party lines, uh, like political party lines. And maybe the commandments are going to lay that low. Maybe they're going to wipe out that, that thought that we had that was based upon popular opinion. Okay? And then the commandments are going to correct it with God's truth. Now, here's a couple warnings. Old Adam will misuse this commandment knowledge. Okay? Uh, two main ways. First, the old Adam will tempt us to works righteousness. That you will start thinking, by hearing the commandments, your old Adam will grab onto that, and your old Adam will be like, see, I'm pretty good in God's eyes. I've done that. I have kept that. And then, the next one is the old Adam will start to compare. Oh, I've done that way better than such and such. Right? Um, and that's what the old Adam does. He, he, he hates God's things, 
So he, when he's presented with God's things, he will seek in the best way possible, and worst way possible, to twist it and abuse the things of God. Okay, so then comes the misuse of judging others. Okay? And by judging others, making yourself better. It's the old Pharisee trick. Right? I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. Right? And it should hopefully make some sense of the world's confusion. It should hopefully bring us some clarity about the things going on in our world around us. Alright. Order of the commandments. First through three of the first table. Creature to creator. Second table of uh, commandments four through ten. The creature to creature. Okay. And then what does God say about all these commandments? Here it is. We read this from Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6. So let's move on to the meaning. This is the catechisms. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them. There's the fear of we should fear and love God. Okay? That's why we fear. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. There's the love and trust. Uh, first commandment is the only one with it. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. The rest of them are all, we should fear and love. Okay. But there's the whole reason why. Okay. That wraps us up for today. Next week we'll start with the first commandment, which is the chief commandment. <coughs> which is the commandment that when you break any of the other commandments, you automatically break the first. Because to break one of the other commandments, you have assumed Godhood for yourself. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your law. We ask that we would rightly use it by your Spirit, that we would gain knowledge of our own callings and vocations and how we are to act, how we are to pray, how we are to confess our sins. We ask that you grant us clarity about the situations in the world around us through the study of your word, especially the commandments, that we would understand things at, at, at their root of how they are spiritually being happening to attack the very things that you have given us. We ask that you grant us this clarity and this peace, that you would grant us the, the sureness of your forgiveness, that when we are presented with our sins, we know to whom we may flee for the forgiveness of those sins, through your Son, Jesus. It is in his name we pray. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>